In the 1970s, Glen Campbell had a hit with a song called Rhinestone Cowboy. And in the song he tells us that he knows every crack in those dirty old sidewalks of Broadway. Well, be that as it may, I think I can say pretty honestly that I know every word in that song of his. And the reason why I know it is because I heard it over and over and over uh, played during one army call-up. Normally, things are very quiet in a platoon base camp. Uh, you could, in broad daylight, walk within uh, 100 meters of a platoon base and uh, not even see it or know that it is there, provided that everything was quiet and there was no movement. There might be a couple of camouflage trucks standing in amongst the trees, uh, ops tent, uh, maybe a cook tent, and scattered around would be the, the bivvies of the soldiers. It was most of the time nothing more than that. There were no permanent structures, no trenches, no barbed wire, no gun emplacements or anything like that. It's just a spot in the bush where maybe 20 men had settled down for a few weeks. Um, but we had a soldier who had recently joined the battalion, um, came from overseas and seemed to have extensive uh, military experience and he'd brought along a, a cassette player and he was a country and western fan. And so uh, we would hear Rhinestone Cowboy over and over again. He was a nice enough fellow and uh, he uh, was very entertaining to listen to, told us uh, stories of uh, his time in Northern Ireland when he was uh, a member of the British Army and uh, oh, there were some harrowing tales that he recounted and I think all of us uh, were quite uh, happy that we were uh, rather in a bush war in Rhodesia and not overseas in Northern Ireland that uh, we had a word for that in the army. Uh, we said that place was Vus. <laughs> we certainly didn't want to go there. Um, uh, but there was something rather contradictory about the soldier. He certainly knew what he was talking about and he certainly had the experience. Uh, but his, his attitude to life um, didn't seem to back up his words. And uh, we, had a, uh, we had a name for someone like that. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of, of a kinder word, but I can't. Uh, we would call people like that blasé. Uh, and this was never said in an approving way. It was, um, it was really a, a bad thing to say about somebody. Uh, it meant that they were, as a soldier, uh, reckless, um, irresponsible, negligent, uh, and all to the, to the ultimate detriment of their comrades. And um, for example, when we first set up uh, the base camp uh, at that spot, uh, this soldier being part of the headquarter element, uh, you know, he never went out on patrol or anything. He was, he was kept at the base camp, uh, did duties as a truck driver or a, or a vehicle guard or other tasks uh, around the camp. When we first arrived there, he erected a bivvy for himself, uh, took his FN and propped it up against a tree. We still had FNs in those days. They were coming to the end of their serviceable life. But nonetheless, it was still the most important part of your equipment because, uh, I mean, that's the thing that kept you alive. Uh, and he just left it. He left it there for days on end. We were in the middle of the rainy season. Um, I would go off on patrol, come back maybe four days later, uh, and my eye would would go across to where that forlorn weapon was standing, where it had been placed days before, slowly rusting away. And eventually, even at a, at a, bit, of a bit of a distance, you could see it was taking on a, a rather reddish-brown hue. 
so much so that one day, uh, as the soldier was uh, walking over toward the ops tent, somebody pointed at him and remarked, there goes the man with a golden gun. <laughs> and as you know, uh, in the James Bond movie, the man with a golden gun was called Scaramanga. And so this name stuck to the soldier. Scaramanga he was thereafter. And he was a great puzzle to me. I couldn't understand how come, with all his knowledge, uh, he was so blasé. And I concluded in the end that it must be that perhaps our war was just too tame for him and it wasn't worthwhile he's, he's making an effort. Um, well, that, that's, that's fine, excepting it affects one, particularly when you are on guard duty, to know that there's somebody like that uh, present uh, in the base camp. Now, when, you, when you're out in the bush, uh, away from a base camp, it's just the four of you, perhaps. Uh, things are much easier. When night time comes, generally speaking, you stop moving. Whether you're on a routine patrol or whether you're on an ambush, certainly. Uh, even if you're doing a follow-up, you will not follow spur at night. So, Soldiers do not move at night unless there is a very good reason for it. If you have settled down then during the hours of darkness and you hear a sound in the bush around you, it ought not to be any friendly troops. It is the platoon commander's top job to make sure that there's plenty of space between his call signs People are not supposed to bumble into each other during the night. It, it, it happens, I, I know, and I've spoken about it before. But all things being equal, if you hear a noise at night in the bush, it ain't another soldier. And it ought not to be local people. There's a curfew in place. They are supposed to be in their homes at nightfall and not moving around in the bush. It shouldn't be livestock that you hear. No cows or anything like that should be wandering around. These animals are required by law to be penned up when the sun goes down. So it shouldn't be any domestic stock. And if it's a wild animal, well, they've been walking around the bush at night since the beginning of time, facing all kinds of dangers. And if if they make a noise, the chances are that they're going to get pulled. But if you hear a sound, more than likely, you can't ignore it because it, it, it is probably the enemy. And so you just blaze away. You don't issue a challenge. You don't call out ask who's there, you just fire. And uh, it's as simple as that. But you, if you're in a base camp, you can't just blow away. Because if you hear a sound, yes, it might be the enemy has wandered into the base camp, uh, ignorant of the fact that you're there. But it's more likely that somebody has got up during the night. And you, you can't just shoot away at your own men like that. The Gooks had the same problem as well, of course. A man that I knew from 8RR uh, was telling me on one occasion how that they were on a patrol and um, they just found themselves near a base camp, an enemy base camp, when some Gooks who had obviously gone off earlier were now on their way back and the gook sentry had heard the approach of these people and he wasn't sure who it was. So he called out a challenge and he said in the vernacular, Do you like Sadza? 
And the reply came back, Yes, I like sadza. Do you like sadza with cabbage? No, I like sadza with meat. Okay, come on in. Well, that kind of nonsense is it's too laborious and long-winded. And uh, But anyway, it was one of the ways in which they uh, identified each other. We had a much simpler approach. We had a set standard method where we took the, the day of the month. So if it was on the 25th of the month, for example, and uh, a man is on sentry duty and he hears a, a noise that he can't identify, he would call out, for example, 20. And he would expect the reply to come back 5. 20 plus 5, 25. If he calls out 5, he would expect to hear 20 or whatever numbers. But of course, one had to be fair in this. You, you couldn't shout out 9 and 3 sixteenths and then start shooting because there's a long silence while somebody's trying to work out the mathematics involved. So um, <clears throat> one had to be fair about this kind of thing. But I wondered about Scaramanga because I, I would sometimes uh, lie in my sleeping bag and I, I know that there's a sentry out there and a sentry is always the most dangerous person you will meet. In whatever army it is or whatever part of the world, I don't care. And I think I say this without any fear of contradiction. The one you've got to watch out for more than the enemy is your own armed sentry. So many people have lost their lives disregarding that fact. And, um, and, and I, I saw Scaramanga as somebody who would just do that. I expected sometimes at night that I would hear the sentry shout out 20 and instead of getting a reply 5 he would get a reply all right beginning with F but it wouldn't be what he would want to hear and uh, I just prayed that the soldiers FN wouldn't have the final word in that conversation so we come back from patrol one day <clears throat> and it's, it's it's been a miserable few days it's rained on and off and the sky's overcast. It's actually quite cold and uh, it looks like it's going to be a, a, a miserable few days ahead as well. And we're just settling down when a lot of activity starts taking place. Trucks start arriving with other troops. And by the afternoon, the whole company is gathered at our platoon base. And that was something quite unusual, but we had found out by then, we'd been informed that uh, we were in for a night march. Uh, we were going to be cordoning off a village in the morning uh, called Chidodo. I understand that that's quite a big place in Zimbabwe today, but at that time it was nothing more than a, than a large village. And so we were due, in company strength that night, to march onto that village, throw a cordon around it in the hours of darkness and in the morning we would tighten the cordon and start sweeping through the village, uh, searching all the dwellings and questioning all the people as it was strongly suspected by the army that there was a, a terrorist presence there. Then came the surprising news that Scaramanga had been selected as the one who would guide the company to the village during the night. I don't know who made that decision. It certainly wasn't our platoon commander. He was a senior executive of an international company in, uh, in, in Civvy Street. And uh, he was a man with a lot of common sense. And uh, I just couldn't see him approving any move like that. But, um, you know, ours is not to question why. When you're in the other ranks, you just do what you're told. And uh, I, I watched as I got my kit ready for the night. The um, section leaders all called together for a briefing. Scaramanga had gone off uh, earlier on in the, in the morning 
uh, with a group of men and he had scouted the terrain uh, and uh, he supposedly knew where uh, the company should be walking that night. So he got everybody together. Now, I don't know what he told them, but the corporal came back with uh, an armful of um, Hessian sandbags. And um, th these bags normally had a plastic liner in them. Th and we put these things to all sorts of good use. But um, he said, just use the sandbags and put them on your feet. So uh, I thought, what is all this about? Why, why must we put these things on our feet? He said, no, it's to, to cover our tracks tonight. And I thought, oh, dear me, is this the kind of thing that they do in Northern Ireland? Because it's a balmy idea. It's not going to fool anybody. Um, if anything, it's just going to leave a great big trail behind us in the, uh, on the ground. But um, I put this, th these things on my feet, but it just seemed like uh, <laughs> madness was in the air. Scaramanga to lead the company, sandbags on our feet, well, what next? And so nightfall came and we set out about nine o'clock, first along a road in a single file. Companies were big in those days. We must have had all of between 80 and 100 men with us. And uh, the section that I was in was near the back of the, the column. And so we walk. Oh, and it's a miserable night. And the rain starts coming down and we have our ponchos on. And uh, all you can see in the gloom is these glistening forms around you, of people walking in the rain. Well, it was okay while we were still on the on the road but at some point we had to leave this and then make our way through the bush it is not easy you know <clears throat> if you're gonna walk at night in the bush even under the best conditions you can't pull out flashlights and maps and start looking to see where you are that you just it's not an option you gotta sit down in the afternoon when there's enough light and you've got to memorize that map and your route you've got to really know what you're doing and you've got to pick out uh, waypoints you know you've got to memorize the thing I've got to go down the drag till I get to a small culvert at the culvert I must turn to one way or I must turn the other I must then proceed till I come across a trail I must then walk along the trail for so many paces and, and you know you've got to this has got to be imprinted in your mind if you want to successfully move around the bush at night and I don't know how much Scaramanga knew of this kind of thing but off we went into the darkness in amongst the trees in this long file of men and the rain is coming down now there's another thing you got to know when you walk in the bush whether it's broad daylight or not but certainly at night it is crucial when the visibility is so bad if you come to an obstacle you're going to hesitate then it's going to take you a few seconds to figure out how you're going to move around this or through this thing while you are doing that the men behind you are starting to pile up I mean, it's, it's in microseconds, but it's happening all the way down the line. The line starts compressing, compressing, compressing. Now you get through the obstacle if you're the lead guy. You can't just set off at the same speed that you approached it. If you do that, the next man who's now hesitating and you clearing off, you've now widened that gap. He now gets through the obstacle. He's got to quicken his pace to catch up with you because he's now falling a bit behind. He's made a bigger distance between himself and the next man. And so this thing gets magnified and amplified. The more people you have there, it's very difficult to put into words and explain. But it's the kind of thing that happens in real life. When you get to an obstacle and you've negotiated it, just slacken your pace. Don't stop because then you're going to have a pile up on the other side over there. But just move along slowly. And, you, and you've got to somehow in your mind be conscious of the time it's going to take for the last man to get 
past that obstacle and then you can you can resume the pace again and you've got to do this instinctively because at the same time you've got to be memorizing your route and you've got other stuff as well that you've got to be thinking about you can't you can't waste time worrying about these obstacles it's got to be like it's just got to be in you and you just got to be aware of it all the time and you don't meet one obstacle on a, on a march there are many 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 so all the time you're varying your pace and you're making sure that you're keeping the men together if you're on your own it's not a problem if you're leading three men it, it's a little bit more difficult but it, it's 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 still easy you can do it if you if you just bear that in mind but if you've got 80 men behind you and you just bumble along and you just disregard those fundamentals it's not long before the whole thing disintegrates and this is precisely what happened by the time we came to that obstacle which happened in this instance to be quite a wide stream we were alone in the bush there was nobody on the other side it was silence and there were still two or three call signs behind us uh, who now also started you know gathering around us and, and we weren't sure what to do we crossed the the stream which way now we don't know where Chidodo is we've never been there before the rain is coming down it's cold the night is silent corporal had no choice he said let's just stick around here till till it gets light enough to see where we are and then we'll take it from there so we sat down in the bush <coughs> and as the night wore on figures would loom out of the darkness and join us ah, that wasn't a night to start blazing away it sounds in the bush because the bush was full of soldiers trying to find their mates and trying to find their direction so in the morning we <coughs> retraced our our steps as it were by then everybody had thrown off those stupid sandbags they probably the remains of them lying in the bush to this day whatever's left of them got back onto the road and proceeded to our base camp uh, and then as the day went on in little groups the men trickled back operation was a total failure Scaramanga the company commander and I think about 20 men managed to get to the village but there was insufficient manpower to to put the plan into effect and they eventually you know came back as well Scaramanga looked worn out as he walked back into the base camp and of course there were a lot of jeers but I think it was all good-natured nobody was offended by it we were used to spending nights out in the rain but uh, <laughs> he never said a word I think he felt so embarrassed but you know in all honesty <laughs> <laughs> he did the best that he could and I think we were all you know secretly quite glad that we hadn't been asked to do that because it was a big responsibility and not an easy task but he went off to the cook tent poured himself a big mug of hot tea gulped us down walked across to his bivvy without a word to us crawled into his sleeping bag turned on his side <laughs> and was soon fast asleep poor exhausted man <laughs> and I'll dream of the things I'll do <laughs> with a subway token and a dollar tucked inside my shoe <laughs> ah yes Mr Campbell in one way or another I suppose we've all felt that from time to time <laughs>